Kingdom Focus. Praise the Lord. We're so glad to welcome you into our Tuesday night uh, Bible study session. We are continuing our series of Courageous Conversations. We're going to be doing something different, though, for the month of March. It's, of course, it's Women's uh, Month, and we're going to celebrate all of our sheroes, uh, both biblically, historically, and currently, who are making such a difference in the life of our people and the life of our species. I just want to invite us into this time of consecration. I want to encourage you uh, to be a witness and to invite others electronically. Let them know the word of God is going forth right now uh, at kingdom.global. They can meet us on any of our social media platforms. Uh, we want you to be an electronic evangelist of one right now and help somebody to get into uh, this time together in the spirit. Let's just pause right now for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we glorify you, we praise you, we thank you, we honor and we adore you. We give you glory for the privilege of prayer and for the opportunity to bask in your presence. In your presence is the fullness of joy at the right hand are pleasures forevermore. And in these times of difficulty, in these dark times when everything is so bleak, God, we take comfort in knowing that we can rest in your sovereignty and in your care. We pray now, God, that you might make these moments sacred by your presence. Come by here, Lord. Somebody needs a touch from you, a word from you. They need to sense your spirit is yet at work and that you're yet moving even during these times. We pray now, God, that you might allow us to hear from heaven as you speak to us through your word, and we give you glory for what you shall accomplish through us for your kingdom and for our good. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, brothers and sisters, we're excited to uh, begin our journey. Let me just pause one more time uh, to invite you to participate in the worship through giving. We have the ability to give electronically, and we're grateful that we have the ability to sow in the good soil. So many wonderful things that are happening in the life of the church. I want to remind you that our beam signing is coming up uh, in just a couple of days, so make sure you come on out. We're going to be all double masked up, socially distanced outside. But we're going to be writing our names and writing scripture on the beam, one of the beams that will be holding up the new sanctuary to the glory and honor of the name of Jesus. And so we're inviting you to come on out and be a part of that. Also want to continue to encourage you to volunteer with our Kingdom Care Ministry. Even though the weather has gotten brisk, people are still in need. And I want to just shout out Reverend Kendra and all of our leaders who are serving every week to make sure that people are being fed and that lives are being changed. And so we want to encourage you to sow into this work. You can see the fruit of your labor uh, being made manifest. And so we thank you in advance for all that you continue to do in the kingdom. Well, I'm excited to welcome uh, back Dr. Nicole Martin, uh, who is uh, our minister, our lead for our Grow Ministry. She's been doing an awesome job and helping to do what God has called us to do as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is to make disciples. Uh, we're not to be making church members or AME people, we're to make disciples. She also is on the board of the American Bible Society, the uh, National Evangelical Association. And she also is vice president, American Bible Society. She is the only sister in those spaces. And she is giving great leadership uh, for the kingdom of God and helping to bring greater awareness and understanding uh, to those who for so long have uh, existed in willful neglect. Uh, Dr. Nicole, come on and uh, greet us tonight. Good evening, everyone. Pastor Wiley, great to be with you again in this Bible study series. Great to have all of you all joining with us as we grow with God together. So listen, we're going to get right into the meat of the matter. This is Women's History Month and sisters are continuing to make history every day. We wanted to start off with a biblical framework because we understand that there's nothing new under the sun. And what we are experiencing today as it relates uh, to interlocking systems of oppression uh, has been around since the word of God. And so we wanted to jaywalk through the scriptures. And there's a text we wanted to look at beginning in uh, Esther, the first chapter. I'm going to ask, Doc, if you would go ahead and uh, read that for us. Absolutely. So the book of Esther really can't be read in just pieces, but for the sake of our time, we're going to read a small portion starting in the first chapter. And leading up to this chapter, um, the book of Esther tells us that King Xerxes was leading at this time. He was on the throne and he was doing a 180 day festival where he was showing off all of his riches and showing off all of his silver and all of his pottery. And then at uh, in verse nine, we also know that his wife, Queen Vashti, was also giving a banquet for the women in the palace. Everything was fine until on the seventh day, King Xerxes asks Queen Vashti to come. He's showing off all of his wares, all of his objects, and he wants to now show off his queen. 
And in verse 12, it says that she says no. So let's skip forward and see what was the consequence of her no. I'm going to read uh, verses 16 through 20, Esther chapter 1. Then Memucan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but also against all the nobles and the peoples of the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women. And so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she would not come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end of disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also, let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the, when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. Right. So that's right. a whole lot going on. Lot. Add one more cherry uh, on top of this uh, milkshake here, because the, the chapter uh, one, I think it's verse seven, also reminds us that the king was uh, drunk. Yes. Uh, he was in high spirits. You got to love the Bible. Probably saying it but without really saying it. Said it was, he was in high spirits because of the wine. Yep. So right. he had several too many. Yep. Now he wants to show her off. He wants to, as uh, Doc said, objectify her. Yeah. And she's not for it. Yeah. And so what, what's interesting is uh, as uh, we were preparing this study, we noticed, and, and here's again why you have to love scripture. God has a way of tucking little kernels up yeah. under the corner of the text that you may not have seen, even though you've read this text for years like we have. Yeah. Uh, but today we both noticed that uh, in the, it, when, when, when the king calls for his wise men, it says those who understood the time. Well, that is the exact same phrase that is used to describe the tribe of Issachar. The right. uh, Bible says because they understood the time and knew what Israel was to do. So these are wise persons yeah. who now are uh, going to provide the king wisdom, mm -hmm. quote unquote, as to how he should deal with Esther. But notice I mean, uh, deal with Vashti. Notice, though, in dealing with Queen Vashti, they then expand the issue, right? So now it's no longer about her. Now it's like, well, if we don't deal with her, then all of a sudden all these women going to start, you know, trying to, you know, run the show and be in charge. And, and what's interesting is the term wise there almost reminds me of how uh, Pharaoh said he wanted to deal with the children of Israel. He mm -hmm. said, let us deal shrewdly with them. Yeah. And so one of the things that we have to make a distinction of is how systemic oppression works. Yeah. That it is not accidental or incidental. It is intentional and oftentimes uh, has a strategy underneath of it. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes that's why Jesus counsels us to be wise yeah. uh, as serpents and harmless as doves. Yeah. We have to be able to exhibit wisdom Mm -hmm. to deal with the kinds of oppressions uh, that we've been dealing with. And particularly, for instance, in this instance, women have been dealing with since the time of the word. Uh, Doc, what do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. There's so much to unpack here. Just what you're saying about this understanding of wisdom, the way that it's used in the text is they understood the systems. They understood how to play the systems so that those who are at the bottom would always stay at the bottom, whether it's the Israelites or in this case, the women. And I think it's also important to know the context of scripture. So the, Le the Levitical laws and all throughout the Old Testament, it's clear women were property in some ways. They were um, to be part of, they, they were counted among the property of the men. But there were clear instances where even in the Old Testament, God elevated women and gave them voice and gave them place. So we see that in the daughters of Zelophehad. You know, they don't have any male descendants and their father is dead. And Moses says, well, let me ask God. And God says, yes, the daughters of Zelophehad are right. They are due the land. So you come to this passage, you have to be so, it's very complex. You have to be so careful. On the one hand, you recognize women were property. They, a, a queen was supposed to just be, you know, beneath the king and he was the top. 
But as I was kind of unpacking this, some scholars have said that the real sin, in quotes, of, of Vashti wasn't just that she didn't show up. It was the fact that she was holding her own banquet for the women at the same time. So it wasn't just like, I'm at home, I don't feel like coming to your thing. It was like, no, my thing that I'm doing right here is better and more important than your thing. And now we have other tensions in the text and it's hard to unpack in our Western eyes, but you're right, this is how systems work. It's about power, it's about oppression, it's about making sure the bottom stays at the top. And when the bottom tries to rise up to say that they're at least at the same level as the people at the top, that's when we get problems. <laughs> and and you, you bring up a great point in terms of using the marital frame to look at this. Right. What's happening is, so he's called for his wife. I mean, this yep. is king and queen, so that's his yep. wife. Mm -hmm. But it's also public, right? Yes. So she's got her people over here. That. He's got his people over here. Yes. So so it's one. It's not like he just said, can you come into the living room? And she said, right. no, there's only the two people in the house. Right, right. They take a very different tack when they become public. Yes. One of the things that, you know, I, I love our marriage ministry and they always counsel our couples, no and old, that whatever is going on between y'all, keep it between you all. Mm. Because when things go public, they have a much, because now people are losing face. Mm. Right? Not just we have a conflict, a different way of seeing things, or we, we have a fundamental, you know, uh, uh, disagreement. Mm -hmm. but now there's shame. Now there's embarrassment. Yeah. And, and sometimes we can play to that. Yeah. And so, oh, and by the way, social media counts too. So yeah, you know, I know. They post, you know, well, if you can't do right, well, yeah. I, we, we all know who you're talking about. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. Whatever you're doing, it's not helping. Um, right. So, so, I, so I think it's really important. These texts, I think the word that you use, uh, Dr. Nicole is so important, that these are, this, these are complicated issues, yes. right? Very and, complex. Right, so we can see He's drunk, so he ain't right. Mm -hmm. But you know, he asked his wife to come during the festival to his festival while she was having her festival. Yeah, maybe some legitimacy there too. Right. So, so there's legitimacy, there's levels of legitimacy, but there's also obvious again stark levels of oppression. Yeah. And I think the larger um, role that we need to understand is 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 sort of the why womanist theology was created. Yes, that's right. And because I think womanist theology particularly brought, you know, sort of complexity theory. Yes. yes. That says this, this isn't so, quote unquote, black and white. Right. Good and evil. You That's know, right. all women are, are good and all men are evil. Yeah. These things are complex. And in order for there to be thriving, there has to be a mutual affirmation yes. of roles versus simply yes. changing who's going to be oppressor and who's going to be the oppressed. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you think about the complexities, the perspective that you shared about the shame, that is real. And then enter the complexity. There are times when things do need to be brought to light, when mm. there are abuses in the marriage, when there is, you know, an over abuse of the shame and when men or women feel victimized or, or bound in their marriage, there, there does need to be some bringing to light. But you're right, womanism, womanism says we need to thrive not at the expense of the other, not at the expense of men. We need to thrive in community with men. And given the dynamics of that time, I don't know if we could have told Vashti to do anything different. Who knows? The Bible doesn't tell us how many times this happened. The Bible doesn't tell us, you know, did he do this all the time? It was 180 days. Did he ask for every night? Did she come 179 days and this was her last straw? The Bible doesn't say, um, but at the same time, the feminine feminism came about saying because men have had um, the four, they've had the power, they've had the platform for so long, take them off the platform. It's mine now. Womanism says in black communities, we can't afford to do that. Because in the 70s, you know, now we're thinking about uh, at somewhat post civil rights, somewhat. In the 70s, when womanism starts to take on a rise, we recognize black men are still oppressed in, in society. Black men are still the target of society. They're, they're the target of victimization. So what sense does it ma make for me to elevate myself over my uh, oppressed man? The goal is that we rise together. 
And the question is, when you rise to your platform, will you make room for me? And I think that's what womanism says. Can we do this together in community? And again, it's complicated. <laughs> Absolutely. So so this is, again, not a matter of, you know, um, competing privileges, but this is about, you know, empowering the community. And so uh, what, what we see in the text is uh, men who are now saying, you know, on this larger scale, if we allow her to get away with this, then it's going to give license to all the other women to start rising up. And that reminded me exactly of the Willie Lynch letter. Yeah. And for those who may not be familiar, of course, Willie Lynch. Uh, was uh, the Bully Lynch letter was a famous document circulated uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, mm -hmm. basically on, on how to break the spirit of enslaved mm -hmm. Africans. Uh, it was basically how to be so brutal, how to be so abusive yes. that there will not be even the hint um, of an uprising or rebellion. And of course, we recognize that whenever there was rebellion or even the rumor of rebellion, it was met with overwhelming force and violence mm -hmm. because of course the greatest fear was that uh, Africans would uh, take up arms and, and fight for their freedom uh, in the way that any oppressed uh, group of people has the right to do. And so what's amazing is that this concept of never allowing, uh, it's basically a zero tolerance concept. Mm -hmm. uh, it's always at work, except when it comes to the position of the oppressor. So yes. what you're seeing right now with, you know, oh, well, you know, January 6th, it was just a misunderstanding. You know, they were they, you know, just got lost and right. ended up in the Capitol, right. right? Whereas any other instance, it would be zero tolerance, yeah. death penalty for everybody. Yeah. What, what's really important, for, I think, for us to understand is that oppression works the same. Yeah. Uh, whether it is based on race, based on class, based yeah. on gender. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it is compounded when those interlocking spheres of oppression locate themselves in the same individual. So when you are a poor black woman, yeah. well, then we know that you have to deal with all of those uh, things. And, and that's why uh, we uh, find actually solace also in the word of God, because God's work continues to show us time and time again that God is on the side of the oppressed. Amen. I think that's so beautiful. And the understanding that um, God is with us, that's the redemptive part of this. Um, if you look at uh, extra biblical texts, if you look at, you know, even some Jewish texts, there are some speculations that Vashti lived a, quote, better life. Mm -hmm. That once she finally got out of the system, she had a sense of freedom. She had a sense of not having to be at someone else's pull. Um, but that kind of progresses the biblical story story forward because now there's a void. And one of the things I have found so interesting about systems of oppression is you have the power dynamic, but you also have the differing narrative between the collective and the individual, which is exactly what you said. When it's capital riots, those are a couple of individuals doing crazy things. When it comes to Black Lives Matter, that's a whole community of a whole system that is a broken people and they all have problems. When it's, you know, uh, when it's Vashti doing wrong, then you have to get you have to deal with everybody, punish everybody, because if we don't punish everybody, then all these women will think they can do it. But then when it comes to Esther, now we're getting into a little bit of individualism. So this narrative, this ebb and flow of individual and collective is important because as black people, we don't always have a choice. As black women, we don't always have a choice. We are typically in community, whether we like it or not. So how do you create a narrative that really lifts the whole community so that you as an individual can, can shine even within that? And I think that may be one of the things God does in this story. We go from the individual of Ashai to Queen Esther, who is both individual, but really represents a huge rising in the community. Absolutely. And, and, and her rise is mm -hmm. facilitated by a man. Right. Mordecai, right? right. So, of course, uh, now the king's on the market again, and he's uh, looking to find his new queen and uh, really this sort of formal beauty pageant. <laughs> oh, can, can I just tell you how Please. this... <sighs> I just want to pause. I know several years ago, there was like this big Hadassah thing, you know, Esther's original name, and it was like beauty queen. And they showed pictures of, you know, beautiful women and said, look at what Esther may have looked like. When I read that text... I think about sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. I think about young women 
being taken from their homes yep. without any say so, without any power and being hauled off into a palace. And you might get to move forward and move upward, so to speak, mm -hmm. and be queen. But if you don't, you're going to be stuck with the rest of these 300 young women for the rest of your life in a harem. Yep. And it just this, it just breaks my heart. Just breaks my heart. Yep. OK, I'm done. And, and well, but the thing is, there's nothing new under the sun. Yes. So it's happening. Lord have mercy. Right now, and we don't even talk about it. That's right. right. Um, and so that's that's exactly what's going on. And so uh, now uh, Mordecai is facilitating this and is giving her counsel. Yes. Wise counsel. Okay, this is what you need to do. Yep. And she ends up becoming now Queen Esther, yes. as you said, began yes. as, you know, Hadassah, her slave mm -hmm. name. Now. Mm -hmm. Queen Esther. And now she's in a pivotal position yes. for which she has been given sort of surface training, right? Yes. Because this was all, quote unquote, a beauty contest and right. whatever kind of contest it was. Right. But it wasn't the kind of, you know, training in civics and training <laughs> that one, right. you know, should have to be in this right. position. Not unlike, you know, yeah. let's just call it straight, the former first lady. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so now you have somebody who's in position and I say this, you know, in, in a compassionate way, who now has this issue of state Mm -hmm. where uh, there now is genocide being threatened against the Jews. Yeah. And Esther is now being called to defend her people by speaking a word uh, to the king. And so you have to have an appreciation for how she's not supposed to be in this position. She has yes. no training, no background for this. Right. So it's easy sort of, you know, for us to sit on the couch in 2021 and yeah. say, why is she selling out her people? Yeah. Well, you know, it's a little more, as we've been saying, a little more complicated than that. Complicated than that. That's yeah. Right. You want to take that for a minute? Yeah. I mean, so the complications are really strong because here she was going through the external training for the role. But but behind the scenes, Mordecai has prepared her. We, we, we kind of can see it. He's equipped her for knowing who she is. And for me, part of the redemptive thread throughout the book of Esther is God has a way of helping us to remember who we are and never lose sight of it, no matter what the cost. So that could be seen in, Esther, in Vashti's life. Remember who you are. You don't have to let people push you into situations where you don't belong. But say with Esther. Sure, she's being prepared to be queen, but Mordecai is preparing her for purpose. You know, he's visible. She can see him walking in front of the city gate. She can see this reminder of who she is. She is not just another pretty girl. She is someone who is a part of a people. And at this time, I mean, I, I think as the story progresses, she gets to know her people are, are in trouble. But in the beginning, it says, don't let anybody know who, who you are, because I'm not ready for you for that to be a liability. But at the right time, let them know who you are. And it reminds me, you know, when when like you're growing up and your parents let you know who you are, your heritage and where you come from. You have to kind of guard that, too, because mm -hmm. your heritage becomes an asset. It can be a liability in some places, but it's an asset about who you are which I think links so beautifully with black history and with the role of the church and teaching us who we really are for critical times. Yeah. And so again, you know, so we see in the text, we see men as yeah. you know, villains. We see men as heroes. We see yes. women as yes. villains, women as, I mean, it's, it's complicated. It's, it is it's complicated. It's takeaway that I want us to come to this text with, come away from the text with that. And, and so Mordecai is providing this counsel yeah. now, you know, yeah. Really, the, the fate of the Jews lies yes. in the hands of this young woman mm -hmm. uh, who has, you know, at first mm -hmm. said, listen, I hear what you're saying. I know you are supposed to be stepping up. But, yeah, the law says that I can be killed. I mean, we yes. see, you know, he wasn't scared to get rid of Vashti. Exactly right. I ain't even Vashti. So I know right. if I step out, you know, yeah. this that's going to be it for me. So, again, she has a legitimate concern. I just can't underscore that enough. And yet... Uh, the Bible says that Mordecai is trying to help her to understand yeah. that, you know, we're always to be, as you just said, uh, Nicole, we're always to be people of faith and that yeah. reminding us of our ethnicity and reminding us mm -hmm. of a familial background, but ultimately our, our spiritual inheritance yeah. is to be people of faith and never to cower in fear because God has not given yeah. us a spirit of fear. Yeah. So in yeah. Esther 4 and 12, it says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he mm -hmm. sent back this answer. Do not think. That because you are in the king's house, you alone, uh, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance 
for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but you, that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. Mm -hmm. And Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat mm -hmm. or drink for three days, night or day. Mm -hmm. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, yes. I perish. So so this thing is, is power packed. You can yes. put on this all day. Yes. One of the things I like about it, I'm going to get my points on the board first. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the things I like about yeah. the text is uh, that, that Mordecai is saying, listen, uh, don't get brand new and don't get amnesia. Yeah. This is something that I think we can't say enough of in 2021. Mm -hmm. You know, um, last year during 2020, I looked at the 10 part series on, on Michael Jordan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, how he literally, he didn't just define the game of basketball. He built a multi-billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industries on his back. He literally created the modern NBA and he created the, the, the modern uh, athletics market, yes. right? But he did that at the cost of his voice, yeah. right? That's right? That, that That's when right. he made the statement that Republicans buy sneakers too, he really was saying that, I am choosing my own personal financial aggrandizement mm -hmm. over advocacy. And we mm -hmm. see exactly mm -hmm. the polar opposite mm -hmm. in LeBron James today, yes. who is the biggest name in basketball, yes, yes. but also just has gotten recently critiqued for basically not just dribbling and playing ball. Yes. And we said, listen, I'm going to use my voice because I have an obligation to do so. I think about right now how we're facing this pandemic. We are being inundated with misinformation, black people are dying because uh, we are deciding to believe the conspiracy theories just like white folks believed in Kunan. Now we're believing these conspiracy theories and I'm waiting to hear the voices of people with platform, yes. right? So where Jay-Z and Beyonce, yes. where are all these yes. people with hundreds of millions mm -hmm. of followers on social media, billions of views yeah. on YouTube saying, I don't wanna see the people who've made me who I am right. to die because of lack of knowledge. And so, mm -hmm. again, the same dynamic we saw then, we're seeing right now. That's right. And as I'm listening to you, the, the phrase that I keep hearing over and over throughout the text and from our comments is this loss and gain. It's a reorienting of the real perspective of what we lose and what we gain. So Michael uh, Jordan says, I'd rather gain the income than to lose a sense of, uh, I don't know, clout among my community. LeBron James said, I'd rather gain um, a, a clout, not clout amongst the community, but gain in advocacy. Maybe that's the way we can frame it, even if it means that I lose some popularity. And I think this, the story of Esther reminds me, Esther had lost so much. The Bible tells us she had no mother and father. So she was an orphan. She'd lost that. She had Mordecai, but then she lost him when she was taken into the king's harem. She was, she had our ethnicity, but then Mordecai said, don't tell any, anybody about it. So it, at the moment, it felt like a loss. So by the time she gets to this moment, I imagine she had to have had some major recalculations of what it's okay to lose so that I can gain something. And I think at a certain point in every Christian life, we have to recalculate what is true loss and what is true gain? And at the end of the day, Paul says it best, I'll lose the whole world if it means I gain my soul. And Esther basically says like, if I lose my own life, that's okay because the gain for my people, the gain for standing up for something is worth it. And I think in this day and age, especially when we think about all of the complications of today, it does force us as Christians to decide what are you willing to risk? Mm -hmm. And what are you willing to risk for the gospel? And as a woman, if you're going to gain your own position, but it means that your um, father, your brother, your husband, your, your friend who's a man loses, is it really gain after all? So how do we navigate loss and gain in a way that's kingdom minded? That has to be a question we wrestle with. Yeah. And, and to recognize that at the end of the day, the kingdom is at bottom sacrificial. Yes. Right. Like from, from the Mosaic law, yeah, from the Mosaic law till yeah. he says those who seek to save their lives yes. will lose, those lose it. Who seek to lose their lives for my sake will find That's it. Right. That That's ultimately right. we find our lives 
Yes. Once we embrace the concept of having to lose our former yes. self. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and so, and so, and what's, what I love about Esther, of course, is that God's name appears no, nowhere in the book. <laughs> that's right? right. That's right. It's that's right. Do, like it's in the Bible, yet yeah. his name is not explicitly mentioned. Yeah. Um, but there are allusions to it. And that's great because, again, we tend to allow Hollywood to frame our biblical thinking. So yeah. we expect, well, if I don't see an angel, if I don't, if the Lord doesn't show up in a burning bush, right. then it's not real. But God does not expo- expose himself oftentimes. Uh, his, it, the anthropomorphic hand of God does not mm-hmm. necessarily reveal itself, but we mm-hmm. see type and shadow of miracles mm-hmm. happening and the presence of God moving throughout our lives on a daily basis. And so, and so you see the allusion to it from Mordecai's statement. Uh, who know, you know, del- relief and deliverance will rise from the Jews from will rise. In other words, you know, it's the same thing that the Hebrew boy said in the fiery furnace. You know, yeah. we believe God is able to deliver us. And if he can, he like that, it can happen. This deliverance right. is not the issue, right? right? And if God decides he wants to deliver us, if you don't do it, he'll find somebody else who would. Month, yes. One month, he don't stop, no show. Yep. But, you know, but also need to understand that you are not going to make it either. Like, yeah. what you're thinking is, is helping is not helping. Like, not taking the vaccine is actually not helping. Yeah. Right? Like, like, you know. Like, but, but like selling out your colleagues at work to try to get ahead is a tactic. It's not a strategy. It's not a long-term plan that's going to lead for success. What you're doing is not helping. And so ultimately, you know, to her credit, Mordecai, uh, Esther receives the word, right? And yeah. that's what wisdom is. Wisdom is recognizing truth and adjusting yourself to it when it, appeal, yeah. when it appears to you. So she says, listen, go tell all the Jews to be found in Susa to fast and pray for three days. I and my maidens, the sisters are going to have a sister circle prayer meeting. Right. We're going to pray, which obviously, again, is allusion to God. And after that, I'm going to go to the king. And here's my favorite interpretation of the text. And it's going to be what it's going to be. It's going to be what it's going to be. Yeah. If I perish, I perish. That's good. Yeah. That's good. And it did, you know, that one portion made me think about that scene in the movie Selma where King is doing the funeral for the man who lost his life. And he's talking about this man died for a cause that goes beyond us. And then I flash forward to like, you know, the Hebrews 11 people died because they had a greater hope. Esther basically says, I will count this another loss because I know, I know what's on the other side. Now I could be reading into the text because she doesn't, it's not like the super hopeful. If I perish, I perish because I know I got a home on the other side. But I do, I do think part of this hope is what sustains us. And, and so many of the things we've talked about can be so demoralizing. We've talked about oppression. We've talked about the systems. We've talked about, you know, even hard issues like trafficking and shame and abuse. And when you put it all together, it can make people feel so low. But the the gift of God is that the real gain is never just what we get on this side. The real gain persists even after death. That's why King could preach the funeral. That's why Esther didn't mind. I mean, there's a sense of like, I recognize that on this earth, I can only gain so much anyway. So what does it look like for us as Christians to store up treasures in heaven and to put the gain, not just on this side, but on the other side, easier said than done, but it it just so much in this text reminds me, you have to have something more to live for than just your own gain. Yeah. And, and Christianity doesn't work without the term, right? It just doesn't work. Like, because as long as you are evaluating it on the comeback and you know, yes. on investment here and now, then those scales, those those books will never balance. Yep. You have to have a sense in knowing, yeah. and you should want to have a sense. Of, it's got to be something better than this. Like it's got to be all there is to life. <laughs> yes. Then yeah, right. Yes. So 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 that you know, our our hope is in God, and our hope yeah. is in the world to come, yes. and our hope is that you know, as Christ comes, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of His Christ. Amen. And that's what it means to be born again. That's what it Amen. means to have Christ in your life as Lord and Savior. That's what it means mm-hmm. to really know him for yourself and allow him to become Lord of your life. And I just want to take this opportunity to extend to every person watching right now the invitation to come into new life and abundant life and eternal life. Mm-hmm. And that door is Christ. He says, I'm the gate. And so I want to encourage you to allow Christ in your life. If you're unsaved, or unsure about what mm-hmm. salvation is about, all you need to do is text the number that appears on the screen. One of our leaders is on standby to pray for you right now, the prayer of salvation to show you in the word of God, what salvation is all about so that you can know 
that forever your name will be written in the Lamb's book of life and that you no longer belong to you because now you've been redeemed, bought with a price and that you are now God's own. And he calls you not simply servant, but he calls you friend. And this is what the work of the church is all about. This is not a TED talk. This is not you just scrolling social media. This is the work of the Lord, Lord's church. And this is why you need to be connected and be a member and be rooted and planted in the body of Christ that's called the church. When you were born again, God gave you gifts and abilities and skills, but you need to have a place to work out your soul salvation. The church is your spiritual gym. It's where you build up your physique and it's where you get proper diet so that you can be spiritually strong. Mm -hmm. And so we would, I would love to be your pastor. We would love to be your church. We want you to text that number. And then if you have fallen out of right relationship, you're in a backslidden state and God has somehow brought you to this Bible study. Don't you click on another thing before you call, text that number and allow somebody to pray restoration and recovery into your life. That, that was the question that, that, that's the statement that Jesus made to Nicodemus. You must be born again. You must be born from above. And just as we were born physically, we have a physical birthday. We also have a spiritual birthday. And I want today to be your spiritual birthday because I know somebody whose physical birthday is today. Dr. Nicole Martin, <laughs> birthday. Yeah, the transitions come through. It's, it's she's got her birthday shirt on and she's working on her birthday, uh, sharing our Bible study with us. And we just want to pray God's blessing on you and on your family. I know uh, Dr. Mark, Mark has something special planned with the girls, That's but he's right. working on something too. So we pray <laughs> that you all have a wonderful celebration and y'all come on, blow it up the chat. Everybody wish uh, Dr. Martin a happy <laughs> birthday as he prepared to be dismissed. Come on, uh, celebrate with us and then you can pray us on home. Amen. Okay, that was like, I was all in the transition, like, yes, Lord, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor Wiley. Thank you all for joining. Let's close in prayer. God, thank you just for working in our lives, even when we don't see your name on the page. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us that there is no earthly system that can compare to the systems of you, the systems that you've created, your divine kingdom. No earthly system can can really come against your kingdom. And we thank you for that. So we pray right now that you would lift the head of every person, every man, every woman who may be listening to us who needs to be lifted. Remind us, God, that you can move in and beyond the system to bring about meaningful change. I pray, Lord, for every person who is trying to find their own voice, trying to assess their own loss and their own gain. God, give us all wisdom that we might have divine wisdom from you so that we, like the tribe of Issachar, might know the signs of the times. And most importantly, God, thank you for drawing us all closer to you. Thank you for allowing someone to hear your voice. Thank you for this time of study in your word. Draw us closer until Christ comes again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you all. Have a great night. Kingdom focus. Focused. Okay.